Um, if you have your Bibles, open to Hebrews chapter 5. We're going to, our, our verses are in 6, but we're going to start in chapter uh, 5. I got in a little bit of trouble last week because I don't very often let Christy look over my notes before I speak, um, but I did last week and, and she said she was a little bit upset because of how much I didn't get covered. And I told her, well, I tend to over-prepare and under-deliver, yeah. but if I, if I delivered everything that I have in my notes, um, you would never eat lunch. <laughs> so if you have any questions about anything that I've spoken on or something that I didn't quite wrap up, come talk to me. You're more than welcome to look at my notes. I've changed the way I do my notes. I used to just do them in outline form with key thoughts and scriptures. Now I actually type them out so that you can actually read them and they make sense. At least they make sense to me. Okay? Um, <clears throat> we are wrapping up, we're coming to the end of this series on the elementary doctrines of Christ, uh, which was tagged onto the, the disciples, discipleship series. Um, I was hoping, my plan was to finish today with eternal judgment and then take next week and, and wrap it all up into one ball for you to take home. Uh, but looking at the notes, there's no way I can wrap all of this up today. So we're going to push everything back a week. I'm, I'm, my goal today is to do the first part of eternal judgment, and then we'll finish that next week. So um, verse 11, chapter 5. The author, writing to the Hebrews, uh, he says about this, we have much to say, this being uh, Jesus being a high priest of the order of Melchizedek. Uh, and it is hard to explain since you've become dull of hearing. The difficulty is not in the explanation. The difficulty would be with the understanding. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, and of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. So we have covered the first five of these six elementary doctrines. We have covered um, laying again the foundation of um, uh, repentance from dead work, faith toward God, instruction about washings, laying on of hands. Last week we talked about the resurrection of the dead, and really these last two are symbiotic. They, they go together. They, they do not exist apart from each other. Okay, so the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about eternal judgment. The first thing that we need to wrap our brains around is that when God created us, starting with Adam, He created us intact. He created us unique individuals. And that happens at the moment of creation even unto this day, when, when there becomes a life, I believe that it's, just, it's not just a physical life, but there is a soul in that life. They're knitted together as one. Now, through the process, just as through the process, the, the body develops, and, and arms, and, and legs, and hands, and feet, and eyes, I, I think the same process is going on with the soul. It's developing. It's becoming self-aware. Now, do you guys know what I'm talking about when I say soul? Is, is every, 
the, the soul, the easiest way to define the soul is it's your mind, your will, and your emotions. It's what identifies you uniquely in the unseen. Okay? It's, it's what's inside of you that makes you uniquely you. Growing up, um, just over a block from us, we had a pair of identical twins, Judy and Jody Wechter. And we called them Pete and Repeat. <laughs> now, my brother could tell them apart. They were in his class and they did a lot of stuff together. I could never tell them apart. I would just kind of mumble my way through hello and and then that was acceptable. But, but there was a unique difference in the two of them. Judy, now see if I get this right, was more outgoing. Jody tended to be more reserved. They were both very intelligent, but Jody tended to be more studious. She, she enjoyed more getting into the, the knowledge and, and the books and things like that. Um, there, there is something even in twins, identical twins, that makes each one unique. And, and what that is, is the soul. It's what God created you to be. Okay? So when we hold on to that, that God created us uniquely, body, soul, and spirit. Now, I, I had somebody come and talk to me. Thank you, Dennis. Because last week I, I talked about, I, I do not believe, and Dennis actually kind of pointed me to a, a better thinking, I believe. I don't believe that when you're born, your spirit is living and active. I believe that it is unborn in you until that moment when the Spirit comes into your life and quickens it. John chapter 3, Jesus is speaking. He says, unless a man be born again. And I said, well, what do you mean born again? Can we go again into our mother's womb? Well, no, of course not. You must be born of water, which some people say is baptism. I don't believe that's baptism. I think that's just representing physical birth. You're born of water and you're born of the Spirit. Okay, so uh, if you guys ever have a question about something I preach up here, be like Dennis. Come talk to me. Because I, I am in no way claiming that I'm 100% right. One of the things that I am both thrilled to look forward to and I'm a little bit scared to look forward to is when it's revealed how much I got wrong. <laughs> because I, I know I'm getting a lot of it wrong. I'm imperfect. Okay, and my brother and I, we've been studying scripture and we counsel with each other for, oh gosh, going on 20 years. And when, when I'm looking at something that doesn't make sense, I'll call him and we'll talk it through. And when he is looking at something and he calls me and, and sometimes we agree, sometimes we disagree. But, but what we've come to understand is that someday we're going to stand before God and all truth will be revealed. And I'll, I'll, you know, I will be just able to see how wrong he got it. <laughs> but I'll see how long I got it as well. Okay? So, I believe that when you are born, you are born with a body and a soul. There is a spirit there that has not yet been birthed. That doesn't happen until the Holy Spirit comes on you. So, we understand that God's intention was to create us to not die. We were not supposed to die. Because... When he spoke to Adam and Eve in the garden, he told them, when you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. Now, we know they ate of the fruit. They didn't just fall over dead. But I believe that in that moment, their spirits died. And I also believe the path started in the deterioration of their bodies. Whatever was keeping them regenerating stopped. And, and you know, then things happened like, the vision wasn't so good as they got older and they got wrinkles and they got saggy and, and they got brittle and, and whatever it was that God had created them for originally that perpetuated their lives, that kept them living, that kept those cells regenerating, stopped. And they literally began to die from that moment on. Okay? So God's whole plan from the beginning was to bring his creation full circle back to where they were intended to be at the start. Ever living. Ever fellowshipping with him. Ever in his presence. Now, I, I think what's coming is going to be greater than what was. 
Because Scripture says that Adam and Eve, they, as they went about the work, God came in the cool of the evening. Scripture tells us that what we're looking forward to is we're going to live and bathe in the radiant presence of our Lord all the time. I, I can't imagine. Scripture tells me I can't imagine how great that's going to be. But we need to understand that God has created humankind to be ever living. Death is an, inter is an interloper. It, it's an interrupter. It, it broke what was supposed to be. Now, part of that, I think, is also God's grace to us. Because if we were to live forever caught up in our sin, how miserable of a people would we be? So I think death, uh, in the Old Testament, they, they talk about death as, as sleeping. It, it's, that, it's that place that they go to in Sheol and, the, and they sleep. That does, I don't believe in, in the, the sleep stage in the middle between when we die and when we are resurrected. I don't think that happens. Scripture says that to be absent from the body is to be present with our Lord. Okay, when Jesus resurrected, he, he brought a train of hosts with him and, and they went to wherever it is that they are. And, and I believe we'll go there. But God did not create us to be ever-living spirits, ever-living souls. He created us to be a tripartite creation that was ever-living, body, soul, and spirit. Okay, So we've got to hold on to that because if you don't hold on to that, the resurrection really becomes meaningless. Okay, what, what need do we have of bodies if we're just an ever-living spirit or an ever-living soul? We don't need bodies. Well, God says we do because He's going to resurrect them. He's going to take the mortal and He's going to make it immortal. He's going to take the perishable and make it imperishable. He's going to, to set right what sin broke. Okay? So, that's the resurrection, but with the resurrection hand in glove comes eternal judgment. The judgment. Now, I believe there are two types of judgment. Types. I say types because I believe there are going to be several judgments. Okay? But there are only two types. But before we get to the two types, we got to talk about the judge. Okay? Because I look at some of the things that go on in the world. And I look at the judges that make rulings, and, and I despair. Not because they're necessarily evil. I believe there are evil judges out there. But all judges are human. All judges work within a finite realm of their knowledge, experience, and wisdom. So no judge is perfect. And so even good judges are going to get it wrong sometimes. Okay? So if we try to take that picture of a judge and overlay it on the, 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 the judgment of God or God as judge, we've created a wrong picture. So let's first talk about our judge. Who is going to judge us? Wow, that went quiet. <laughs> Who's going to judge us? God. God. Through... God the Father through God the Son. Okay? Let's look at some of the attributes of our judge. Matthew 5.48 says, You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So He's the perfect judge. He's without flaw. He never gives a wrong verdict. 1 John tells us he has no sin. 1 John chapter 3, verse 5. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there was no sin. There is no sin. Okay? So not only is he perfect, he is sinless. So he's not somebody that's sitting up there like the judges today. We have judges today that are making judgments against people for crimes that they themselves are guilty of. But our judge is not going to be guilty of anything. And so when he makes a judgment, he, you know it's going to be a right judgment because he's perfect and he doesn't sin. Okay? So he's perfect, he doesn't sin. Three, he is impartial. 
He does not show favoritism. He cannot be bribed. What do you have that you can offer him? Wow, I've never seen one of those before. He created everything. It's all His. Acts chapter 10, verse 34. Peter is speaking. He says, So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality. Now this is, this is huge. Because this chapter is when Peter is called to go and minister to the Gentiles. Up to this point, even throughout the ministry of Jesus, the whole focus of the ministry has been to the Jews. To the fulfillment of the promise that was given directly to the Jews and via the Jews unto us. But up to this point, the whole focus has been the Jews. Remember the, the Syrophoenician woman coming to Jesus and asking Him to heal her daughter. And He says... Well, it's not right to give to the dogs what is intended for the children. My, my ministry is to the Jews. And she says, yes, but even the, the dogs get to lick the crumbs that fall from the table. And, and to me, that's audacious faith right there, isn't it? I mean, that's, that's someone she knows that he can heal her daughter. And she's not going to take no for an answer. And she, she exhibits audacious faith. And Jesus looks at her and says... Your faith has done this. Your daughter as well. Okay? The centurion. Now it says that he was a believer of some measure because he, he helped to build the synagogue. They, they, the Jews told him, you know, he is a man upright. And, and he comes to Jesus and, and the focus of Jesus' ministry is supposed to be the Jews. But he steps outside of that. Why? Because of the centurion's faith. The centurion tells him, I'm not worthy to have you come under my house. But I understand authority. I tell this man to go and he goes. And I tell this man to come and he comes. And I understand that you have the authority to do this. And Jesus says, I have not seen such faith in all of Israel. Okay? But the focus, the majority of what Jesus was doing was unto the Jews. Because salvation is to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles. Why? God didn't tell me why. He just said that's the way it is. Uh, so, okay, I accept it. Now, Peter, sitting on the rooftop, has a vision. And the sheep comes down with all the animals and the boy says, take and eat. And he says, Lord, they're unclean. I've never eaten anything unclean. I, I wouldn't do that. And so the, the sheet is lifted up and it comes down three times. And, and Peter catches a clue. Mm -hmm. There's a knock at the door and they go and they say, uh, you know, we need you to come and, and speak here. And, and, and Peter understands that this whole vision, this whole thing was done to get it through his thick skull. That God's salvation was intended for the entire populace of the world. That that was God's plan. Because when Adam and Eve sinned, they sinned for all people, didn't they? Because everybody that came out of them is all of us. So God's plan was to work it back in. He was going to speak to and use the Jews and through them bless the world. If you, Let's look at it another way. When the temple was in use, and it was being used rightly, you could not walk in with your fork and use your fork in the temple for any purposes. Why? Well, because your fork is not holy. It has not been sanctified. It has not been ritually cleansed. It has not been made holy. But the the utensils that were in the temple could be used. Why? Because they were made holy. Well, because they were gold? No, because your fork could be gold too. Well, is it because they were of unique design? No. They were designed to be functional. 
And yet, that fork taken out of the temple is exactly like any other fork. God chose the Jews to bless first that they might be priests, a nation of priests, that they might be able to take God into the world. Okay? So, you can look at it this way. The Jews for a time were those holy utensils that were in the temple. The veil has been rent and the Spirit of God comes out and it makes every utensil that desires that comes to Him holy, righteous, fit for use in the service of the King, of the, the God that we serve. Okay? So, we know that God is impartial. Uh, Paul writes in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So our judge is impartial. Now, what, what's interesting here is did you catch the phrase at the end there? What is it that, that, that unites everybody? Uh, I heard it whispered, say it loud. Jesus. Jesus. Yeah, it's whether or not you're in Jesus. So in Christ Jesus, there is no partiality. God doesn't go, well, <laughs> well, Glenn, I really prefer people with hair. <laughs> So, you know, you're out. In Christ Jesus, we are the same. Now, we're called to different positions in the body, but we are all inheritors of all that Christ Jesus has given. But that right there creates a difference, doesn't it? Because there are those that are in Christ, and there are those that are not in Christ. And see, this is where the two judgments come in. Those in Christ will be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. And we're going to go into all of these later, so don't freak out because I'm going to explain what these are. Those outside the body of Christ are going to be judged at the great white throne. Okay? Now, in each case, they're going to be judged on what? Works. What they did. What they did. But what makes the difference between which judgment you face? That's right. Whether or not your name is in the Lamb's Book of Life. Okay? So you're going to be judged on your works whether you are saved or unsaved. But if you're saved, you're judged unto reward... And if you're not saved, you're judged unto punishment. I can't imagine there's any less hot places in hell. And the, the lake of fire, the outer darkness. There, there's no comfortable places there. So whatever good anybody did outside of Christ isn't really good in eternity. Well, no, God uses it. Absolutely God uses it. I believe absolutely that God used Hitler. Was Hitler saved? Absolutely not. I believe absolutely that God uses who He wills to accomplish His purposes. Scripture tells us that when God determines a thing is to be, it will come to be. Okay? So let's, let's take a look. Our, our judge is perfect. He's impartial. He has no sin. He cannot be bribed. Scripture tells us that Jesus specifically of the Godhead will be the judge. John 5.22, Jesus is speaking to the disciples. He says, For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. Okay, So we know that Jesus will be the one that we will be judged by. We'll stand before Him. Um, Judgment, let's move forward to talking about the judgment. Throughout Scripture, 
we see something that is referred to as the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. As a matter of fact, in, in a couple of places, it's called the great and terrible day of the Lord. This is the day of judgment. Now, throughout the Hebrew Bible, there are numerous prophecies about the day of the Lord. Uh, let, let's take a look at a couple of them, just so you can understand where I'm coming from. Um, Isaiah chapter 13, verse 6 says, Wail for the day of the Lord is near. As destruction from the Almighty, it will come. Ezekiel chapter 30, verses 2 and 3. Son of man, prophesy and say, Thus says the Lord, Wail, alas for the day, for the day is near, the day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of clouds, a time of doom for the nations. Joel chapter 2, verse 1 says, Blow a trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord is coming. It is near. One last reference. Zephaniah 1.7 Be silent before the Lord God. For the day of the Lord is near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice. This period, this day of the Lord. Let's get some descriptions of what this is going to be like. Zephaniah chapter 1 tells us a day of wrath is that day. A day of distress and anguish. A day of ruin and devastation. A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and thick darkness. Some people read these passages and they say, well, those were fulfilled. They were fulfilled when Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians or under Antiochus IV or when Titus sacked Jerusalem the second time. But there's, there's one thing that's missing from all of these different components. Yes, God displayed judgment there. He judged Israel. He judged Judah. And He sent them into exile for violating His law. And He called them back. He allowed Israel to suffer under the Greeks. He allowed Jerusalem to be destroyed under the Romans. But the thing that is missing is the judgment on the world. All of those things specifically point to judgment of Israel. But God says that His day, the day of the Lord, is when He comes to judge the world. As a matter of fact, um, it says that the valley will be the judgment valley. That's the Kidron, correct? Jehoshaphat. And all the nations will be gathered to be judged. Now, in the Hebrew Bible, we find that God is judging nations. But the New Testament refines this. And says it's not just the nation. It's the individual. Every single individual. Nobody gets out without judgment. Every single person will stand before God, God the Son, and must give an account for their lives. And I thank God that I can do that with the covering of His Son. Because if I did not have that covering, I would stand guilty. And I would have no mediator. I would have, there would be no redemption. There would be nothing that could save me. Because God is a perfect judge. He is without sin. And in eternity, there will be no sin. So he, he by his very nature, just can't write a blank check and say, Oh, it's okay, everybody's in. 
He did write a blank check, but we got to sign it, don't we? We got to write out who it's made to, and we can only do that for ourselves. Trust me, I've tried writing it out for other people. They got to sign it themselves. Okay, so let's let's look at the first judgment. This is a judgment based on works, but the group that it is drawn from are those that have been saved. This is not a judgment to determine where you will spend eternity. If you are in this judgment, that has already taken place. That's when you sign the check. As soon as you accept that gift of grace, as soon as the Spirit of God comes on you, and marks you as one of His. That's already decided. Your eternity is decided from that point. Okay? You're still going to screw up. You're still going to have to learn to unlearn behaviors. You're going to have to be trained in righteousness. You're going to have to endeavor to maturity to be sanctified, to become more holy in how you live. But your price has been paid once for all. That blood covers every sin you ever did, every sin you're doing, every sin you ever will do. Okay? But the understanding is that as that spirit grows inside of you and, 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 and enlivens you and brings about the reflection of Christ from you, you will begin to look less and less like yourself and more and more like Him. Okay? That's a commonality we should all share. Okay? Because we all have the Spirit living in us. So we should all have the fruit of that Spirit hanging off of our lives. Now we're all called to different tasks, different jobs, so we're, we're going to be individual in the way we go about doing things. Uh, my roommate at Bible school, uh, the, Steve is a preacher. Man, he is an incredible speaker. He's dynamic. He's, he's engaging. He, he, he has just something about him when he gets up on that stage. I'm not. And I don't want to be. That's not what I'm called to be. I have a different job. I teach. I try and get you into the Word. I want to encourage you to dig deep into the Word. You're never going to dig so deep in the Word that you've got it all. Okay? It's, it's never going to happen. My roommate, Steve, he, he's a, a pastor of a church that has multiple campuses. I don't ever want, I don't want to outgrow this building. I would like for us to bring people into the body of Christ but I like the communion that we have here. I like the fellowship that we have here. Uh, Steve has people in his church he's never met. I don't, I don't want to be like that. I want to know each and every one of you. I want you to know me. We have different tasks in the body, but we all have the same spirit. We're all part of one body. We all should have the same fruit hanging off of us. Now some of us, are going to have fruits that are bigger and more ripe and, and better appearing. But, you know, maybe, maybe my fruit is more developed here and I'm working on this one. God's Spirit is my little shriveled grape is needing life injected into it. But He's promised that will happen, right? Because He says if, if we are grafted into the vine, the vine provides us life, right? So I, I know it's coming. It's coming. So, what is this judgment about then? If it's not unto where you will spend eternity, what is it about? Oh, somebody knows. Don't be shy. Crowns. I'm sorry? Crowns. Crowns. Awesome. Do you know how many crowns I found in Scripture? How many crowns are there in Scripture that we, that we know of? I, I know... What I found, there might be more. I found five different crowns. Five different crowns. 
Let, let, let's look real quick, okay? Uh, I'm just going to tell you what they are. I'm giving you the reference. You can look them up later. First, there is the incorruptible crown. Incorruptible. It cannot be blemished. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25. The incorruptible crown. Second, the crown of rejoicing. I grew up in a church that is significantly more outwardly demonstrable than, than we are. They're, they're more physically engaged in worship than we are. <coughs> they clap every song. Every song. I went to the Bible school from this denomination. I, I had a lot of trouble there. Because there were things that, that they believed that I didn't really believe. But, but they, their, their worship... I grew up across the street from a Baptist, a Baptist church in San Diego. It was a black church. Those people know how to worship. Oh Lord. We would go to church. And as we're driving out the church, we can hear the organ playing. We're going off to go to our church. When we come home, I don't know if they ever stopped. Because it sounds to me like they're still doing the same thing, going on and on. We've eaten lunch, and we're sitting out, my brothers and sisters, we sit out in the front porch and listen. They're still going. The church that I was a part of, they really encourage uh, that, that you, you show your worship. I, I don't believe that. I don't believe that there will always be an outward expression. I believe that there will sometimes be. But, but I'm an inward person. When I worship God, I, I, don't, I want to tune you guys out. I hope you tune me out too. Because man, I really mess up the words. But when I'm worshiping, I want it to be me and God. Well, so I go to this, this Bible school and, and everybody's excited and they're, they're playing music and it's always upbeat and, and, and it's loud and, and people bounce and jiggle and sway and dance. <laughs> this white boy don't dance. Okay? I got caught up in the excitement at this, this first night I went to this church. Uh, I went I got caught up in the excitement. I stepped out to dance and I ran headlong into one of the older ladies at the school. I almost killed her. And God told me to put my butt back where it belonged. <laughs> your, your job is to stay here and not move. Okay, some of us are anchors, some of us are willows. Okay, I'm not a willow, I'm an anchor. Okay, poor Marcia, I almost killed her. Because she was doing, uh, she's a willow. Man, she was swaying and dancing and moving and, and I stepped out right into her. We all have different callings, but we're all going to bear the same fruit. So, the crown of rejoicing, 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 through 20. The crown of righteousness, 2 Timothy 4, 8. Now this is kind of cool, because if you think about this, all of these things are, are things that have already been given to us. And it's like we're going to receive a crown that is a physical representation of what God has already given us. Okay? So, we have the crown of righteousness, knowing that we stand before Him righteous, not because of what we've done, but because of what He's done. Did I give you the reference for that? Yes. Okay, 2 Timothy 4 8. The, the last one, number five. Oh, I'm sorry, there's one more. Um, number four, the crown of life. James 1.12 Revelation 2.10 The crown of life. I, I can't even wrap my head around what that would look like. The only thing that comes to mind, and I know it's not this, but the thing that comes to mind is that little spinny thing on the game of life that you see how many... And it's colorful, and everything has its different place, and, and I, I can picture it like not with just cardboard colored and different colors, but like different kinds of 
of gems and, and rubies and sapphires and diamonds and, and things and, and, and it, it flashes and it reflects, but it's life and it's living. Okay? But that also has been given to us. Okay? Because we have Jesus. He's the living water. Alright? The, the last one. The last one. The crown of glory. 1 Peter 5, 4, the crown of glory. Now these are, uh, if somebody knows of other ones, come talk to me after service. Uh, I just kind of glanced through real quickly as I was looking at these things, and, and these were five that I came up with. If you find others, let me know, because I want I want to dig deeper into this later. I want to get an idea of what, what's going on with all of these different crowns. Now, when we receive these crowns, what are we going to do with it? Actually, Scripture doesn't say that. Did you know that? Actually, the Scripture tells us about the 24 elders that are around the throne. And as the, the, the spirits give praise, they will bow down, they will take their crowns, and they will lay them at the feet of the throne. Now, I believe, this is, this is one of those things you can differ with, that's okay, I believe that it's 24 because it's 12 and 12. I believe the first 12 represents the 12 tribes of Israel. Thus, all of Israel. I believe the second 12 represents the apostles. Thus, representing their call to all the world. So, the, the, to the Jew first, and then to the Gentile. That's, that's just what I think. Okay? Okay? open to it being wrong. I'm open to other interpretations. That's just what I think. But because this is what I think, I think they are representative of all of us. And their action will be representative of all of us. I believe that as they do, we will do. I don't know that we can do otherwise. I, I don't know that... I mean, when, when we come into the presence of the Almighty God, I used to hate thinking about heaven when I was a kid because I had this image of sitting down all day on a fluffy cloud playing the harp. I did not want that. I was an active child. I was busy. I was always doing stuff, most of which I shouldn't have been. And I found out later, oh, you're not supposed to take the dog poop and throw it over the fence? It's supposed to go in the bag? Our neighbors had a Doberman. We had a St. Bernard. Oh, yes. That was a lot of manure going back and forth over the fence. I didn't know that was a problem until my dad came out and gave me a physical demonstration of that being wrong. Okay? But, but this idea of sitting on a cloud and playing the harp all day, I don't play the harp. I don't want to play the harp. We'll let Deb do it. We can sit on our clouds and listen. She's going to be our teacher. I still don't want to play the harp. <laughs> but that's not what heaven's going to be like. That's not what heaven's going to be like. Think about the happiest you've ever been in your life. That's going to be his tears in heaven. Because we will have a joy that we cannot express in this life. We will have a satisfaction. You will not want anything. I don't think it's because you're going to have it. I think because you're going to see how valueless it is compared to what's there. It's not like you're going to get to heaven and go, Oh, I've got the new Xbox X whatever. Because that's going to be irrelevant. You're not going to get to heaven and, and want a bigger house because you will have no want. Everything will satisfy you. <clears throat> so five crowns. Incorruptible. Rejoicing. Righteousness. Life. Glory. We're going to stop there. Next week I'm going to try and wrap up the judgment of the believers and we're going to talk about the other side of the fence.
my prayer is that as you start looking at this and, and that you would invest yourself into the Word to take a look at not only what's coming for you, as fantastic as that is, as unimaginable as that is, I hope you get a good look of what's coming for others. Because if you are not moved, and if you are not, if, if, if birth inside of you is not a desire to spare them that, you really, really, really don't get it. As indescribably awesome as this is, this will be indescribably horrible. <clears throat> we use the word hell so much that, that we really <clears throat> do not appreciate what it is. So I, I want to encourage you this week, get into the word. Start digging. Look at what comes for us, what we are looking forward to, what we rightfully should be excited about. But also look at what's coming for them. Start taking a look at, at what they have chosen and what they get. Yeah. I have a question. What was um, Incorruptible Crown, the first grade game? What? 925. Yeah, 925. And the glory one was? Glory was 1 Peter 5 4. Okay. 1 Peter 5 4. <clears throat> Father, we thank you today. Father, that you have given us assurance of our salvation, that your spirit rests on us, that your spirit convicts us of sin, leads us to righteousness, that your spirit teaches us. I ask, Father, that you would make us a people of faith. Audacious faith. That, Father, you would birth in us the joy that comes from knowing you, from having relationship with you. That you would birth in us the fruit of your Spirit, that it would grow and be attractive and give life. Father, I ask also that you would teach us just exactly what we have been delivered from. What eternity you have spared us. Birth in us, Father, a desperation for the lost. Birth in us, Father, a yearning to be those workers in the field that the full harvest might be brought in. Father, give us your heart to love. We pray these things, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. <clears throat>